thinking about putting together that grant. So if you don't mind, sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll say I joined the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center in um, early 2017. So uh, there was a very long collaboration already happening between um, the CASC and the National Park Service, specifically with the Climate Change Response Program in terms of providing climate information uh, data and sort of interpretation of that data in support of park planning processes. And one, um, one way of dealing with the spread of risk and uncertainty uh, in climate projections is to use this scenario planning approach. So rather than um, dealing with every single model realization, you pick a spread of um, possible features that's divergent and contrasting, and then you use that as a way to sort of think about the risk of um, what different uh, futures might hold. And, you know, as we worked through this process, we realized that there was a lot of sort of pain in terms of working with climate data, um, they're large data sets, they're not intuitive to work with. Um, and so we have had a very long ongoing conversation about how we might be able to best support those um, sort of processes, how we could support researchers and managers in terms of working with climate data in a way that was less painful. Um, when we came to uh, CU and started working with Earth Lab, um, and Max will talk a little bit about this. They have an open workflow and open source approach to working um, on creating tools for working with data. And so it seemed like a, a really good fit and a good match for leveraging the skills that they could bring to the table and some of the partnerships we could bring to the table um, to finally get this um, completed as a start to finish workflow. So I'm super excited about where we're at um, with the project and really excited to start having people work with um, the product that we've developed so far. And I'll turn it over to Max at this point to kind of dig into things. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Aparna. Thanks, MTAs, for that introduction. And, and thank everyone for showing up and introducing yourselves today. Um, MTAs, what do you think about pasting the link to our notes document in the chat so that people can write down questions if they have them? You're welcome to, to interrupt, but I know for some people, writing down a question or taking notes can also be helpful. Would everyone be okay if I pasted the link to our notes document? I'm seeing a thumbs up. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I was muted. Go ahead. Yeah. All right, I'm pasting that into the chat now. Um, so in that link, uh, it's a Google Doc, and you'll find um, a link that I'll present and then. Uh, feel free to add those or whatever else questions that you might have. Let me share my screen here. So I threw together some slides. And I know sometimes this can be tricky, but are people seeing the slides now that I'm sharing my screen, or do you still see this, uh, like the Google Drive slides window? We do Google Slides window. Okay, I will, uh, I've got a dual monitor set up here that might be causing some issues. So let me, let me undo that. And I've lost my zoom. Oh, well, okay, let me see if I can. We still see your slides. Okay, <laughs> good. I'll just present with this and uh, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, climbers, Climate Futures Toolbox, which is an R package that we developed for, for the reasons that Aparna had laid out. Uh, a lot of people have contributed to this. Travis Williams uh, did the bulk of the, the actual programming, and he was supported by a grant from the USGS uh, community for data integration that Aparna had written. Um, and MTOS has provided a lot of expertise throughout this process, uh, as has Brian Miller and Aparna. Um, and Brian Johnson. And if you want to check this, this out while I'm talking, you can uh, go to github.com slash earthlab slash CFT. 
for Climate Futures Toolbox. So I'll start with an observation that I doubt will be too controversial, that climate, using climate data can be hard, especially if you're not a climate scientist by training, as many of us are not. And um, it's also necessary to use climate data for effective climate adaptation. So to, to help place this package in context, um, I adapted a, a graphic that the National Park Service had put together about climate adaptation. And they lay out these sort of four sequential steps that begin with framing the issues. So for a lot of the work that the NC CASC is involved with, uh, this looks like a conversation with our stakeholders, maybe at a, na a national park, to figure out what are the resources that are priorities for them um, that might be affected by changes in, in future climate. And then given those issues, try to identify and synthesize relevant science to tell us something about you know, how, for instance, warming might affect uh, resources of interest. And then we hold a climate adaptation workshop where we actually sit down with scientists and resource managers and walk through three to five plausible climate futures and try to, to talk about what those futures would mean uh, for research resource management in that area. And then after walking through those scenarios, um, start to plan and, and take action. And if necessary, loop back to um, evaluate unanticipated effects and sort of feed back into understanding the issues. And climate data can insert at any one of these steps, but it's particularly important at this exploring climate futures step. So here we try to identify a small number, like a manageable number of potential climate futures that are plausible, but also divergent um, so that we can capture like the realistic range of climate futures that we might be facing in a particular region. Um, and in order to get these climate futures, you've got to munch quite a bit of climate data, typically. So you've got to extract data for region of interest, which sounds simple, but as Aparna had mentioned, these climate data sets can be quite large. So even extracting data for a particular region uh, can be a lot of work. And in many cases, we want to work with um, derived variables that may not be a part of the sort of available climate data. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, but in terms of how you choose these particular uh, futures, the approach that, that we tend to take is we come up with a scatter plot where on both axes, we've got some uh, difference between a historical and a reference period. So for instance, on this plot, the x-axis shows uh, change in precipitation in the future relative to some historical period. And each one of these dots is a different climate model. And I've colored them by the greenhouse gas trajectories. And the y-axis here is the difference in a reference period relative to historical period um, in maximum temperature. And so in this sort of two-dimensional space, you can see some spread in what these climate models are predicting. And the idea here is we want to choose three to five models, three to five points in this space that captures the range of possibilities. Um, and it's, it's not exactly as easy as just drawing a, a convex hull, for instance, and, and trying to choose three to five points that maximize the area. There's, there's quite a bit of expert knowledge that goes into this process as well. Uh, but the idea is we want to take a subset of potential climate futures to work with, because working with, for instance, 20 different climate futures um, is really hard to do. We take those three to five climate futures and summarize them in a, in a meaningful way. So this is a, a table that MTAs had developed for some previous work. And these three columns on the right each represent a different climate future. And I really like this, this approach. These are essentially named climate futures. So we could refer to these by like what the uh, greenhouse gas trajectory and uh, general circulation model are, but instead we call them names that people could recognize like hot and dry, warm and wet, feast and famine. And then we summarize a number of climate variables of interest. And, and these are chosen 
based on this initial issue framing. So we know ahead of time what particular climate parameters are going to be of interest when we're doing these uh, adaptation planning workshops. And these tables provide a really nice sort of quick reference as people are trying to think about what the implications are of these climate features for their resources. Um, and so the idea is we want to make it easier to get to this point because in order to make this table, you've got to, to turn through, uh, in some cases, hundreds of gigabytes of climate data, summarize it, uh, generate your own new parameters, um, and all of that is, is quite a bit of work. So really what, what we're targeting are these two middle steps in this uh, scenario planning process of exploring climate futures and synthesizing available science. So for every climate future, for each one of those three to five climate futures, uh, in collaboration with scientists and resource managers, and so this, this means literally like sitting down in a, a group of maybe five people and walking through each scenario, you try to identify what the impacts are for that particular climate future. Think about potential management actions that you could take and, and try to prioritize those actions. And if there are things that you, you don't know, uh, that's actually pretty important. So for instance, if, if you don't know how changes in the freeze-thaw cycle are gonna affect historical building, uh, for instance, you might be able to identify a science need around that particular knowledge gap. So to bring it back out to the sort of high level, um, climate data can be hard to use, but it's necessary and good tools can help. So we developed a tool, I hope it's a good tool. Here are some of the goals that we laid out initially. We want to lower the barrier of entry for climate data consumers that use R. And so uh, this is really our, our audience, people who are using climate data and that have some R programming experience. So if, if you're not familiar with R, it's a programming language um, that is commonly used in ecology. Um, and so that's sort of who we're, we're hoping to support with this particular tool. And then for that audience, we also like to be able to automate some of the more common scenario planning data tasks. Um, these also carry over into some other activities, which I'll talk about. And in the process, we're, we're hoping to empower a larger user community. And I hope that we've got some members of that community here today, potential members. And finally, um, there's a, another benefit of building software, which is you can reduce the potential for errors by building a robust test suite. And I'll talk about that later. So I understand there may have been a little bit of confusion uh, with the, the renaming of this package, which happened this week and resulted in some broken links. So this used to be called the Climate Scenarios Toolkit, um, but now we're going with Climate Futures Toolkit. And essentially what this package does is four things. One, it helps you download climate data programmatically so that you don't have to click around in a web browser and, and hit download for a whole bunch of files. And once you've downloaded those data, it helps you extract the data for a particular region of interest. So maybe you've got a national park that you're uh, particularly concerned with, or maybe you just have a shape file that defines your region of interest. You can extract those data with this package and generate uh, a data frame, um, which is, if you're not familiar with a data frame, it's essentially just a table of daily climate data where each row would represent one day and you might have a column for temperature and precipitation, for example. And it turns out that getting climate data into this tabular format enables a lot of other analysis. Um, in, in R, that's often referred to as tidy analysis. So you can use, for instance, ggplot, if you're familiar with that package, to visualize climate data. Um, and the really nice thing about this package is the users don't even necessarily have to know what format the data are in or where those data were even pulled down from. So we're, we're essentially hiding that from the user because in many cases, people don't really care. They just want to quickly get the data that they need to use and analyze it um, to support their particular use case. So um, we have first class support for data frames and tibbles, which is essentially this tabular representation here. If you don't have any experience with NetCDF, uh, that's not a problem. But if you do have experience with NetCDF and you actually want to do something with the raw data, 
uh, we make it really easy to do that as well. So we want to support sort of quick and dirty analyses, but if you're an expert, we have also want to empower you to do whatever sort of specialized analyses you may need to do on the raw data as well. So we spent a lot of time before we wrote any code really thinking about what particular climate data set we want to support. Um, we thought about Maka, we thought about Loco, we thought about quite a few others. And we, we ended up settling on Maka for a few reasons. One, it's widely used um, and it's fairly well vetted, provides daily data, which is important for understanding um, extremes and day-to-day -day variability. And it's a downscale data product, so it's relatively high spatial resolution. It's, it's about four kilometer uh, pixel sizes. And then this was a bit of an unanticipated challenge, but we uh, figured out somewhere along the way that actually getting climate data with a stable connection where you can reliably download data sets without interruption is a challenge. Um, and so we were able to get pretty stable access to the Maka data set using a combination of X-Array, which is a Python library, and Reticulate, which is sort of, a, it's an R package that helps interface with the Python programming language. So this tool actually uses both R and Python. All the Python code is under the hood. So if you only know R, that's no, no big deal. And we sort of thinking about our, our actual use case and why we were building the package, um, we use that to guide the documentation that we wrote. So we're using real use cases. In this case, the scenario planning workshop we did in 2019 at Wind Cave National Park to write vignettes. And vignettes, if you're not familiar with them, are essentially like long form tutorials for our packages. And so we walk the users through how you would actually go about um, acquiring and processing data for uh, a scenario planning exercise similar to what we did at Wind Cave National Park, where you've got to get the data, compute some derived variables, and generate some visualizations. And if you've never been to Wind Cave National Park, I highly recommend it. I hadn't been until this uh, workshop, but uh, you do get to see some really cool wildlife. This is a prairie dog with a buffalo in the background. Um, and then the last goal that we had was reducing the potential for errors. And the way that we do that is we place a high priority on testing our software. Um, so these are all the different scripts that comprise the program that we wrote. And we've written a pretty extensive test suite so that we can actually um, check to see if any functionality breaks. And the tests run daily on a continuous integration system. And uh, the package is built against three operating systems, Windows, OS X, and Ubuntu. Um, and so all of that is essentially just to ensure that this package continues to work in the future. Um, and if it stops working for whatever reason, we know about it. So I think there was an example last week, the National Park Service changed the URL where they stored their uh, shapefiles for all of their park boundaries and we had to update it quickly. So with this test suite, we hope that we can catch those types of issues early before it becomes a problem for any users. So I wanna give everyone a quick tour. Let's go to GitHub. Uh, and this link is in the notes document as well. This is the homepage for the Climate Futures Toolbox on GitHub. And if you scroll down, you can see the README, which has some installation instructions and a quick start guide. Um, if you're familiar with Docker, we also provide a Docker container to run this. Um, for instance, if you don't want to actually install Python and you don't want to install R on your system, you can run this all through Docker in a web browser, um, and that makes it nice and easy. And I'll show you this vignette that I mentioned that's based off of our work at Wind Cave National Park. And this will give you a taste of, of what the package actually can do. Um, so we try to give users sort of a, a sense of what they'll get out of the vignette and what the requirements are. Um, you will need some disk space to store this climate data. Um, but in this particular example, we pared it down a little bit, so you only need uh, half a gig. So hopefully that's pretty manageable for our users. And to, to sum up, I'll try to just focus on the, the sort of um, highlights here. In order to get climate data for Wind Cave National Park, uh, you would use the CFT data function. 
And we have first class support for national parks. So you don't even need a shape file. You can just say park equals wind cave national park. And this package will automatically find the boundary for that national park and extract the data for you. You can set a, a time range. So here we're getting daily data from 1980 to 2040. And you can store it in a local directory. So if you've got a, a folder on your computer where you want to keep the data, you can specify that here. There are a number of, of climate parameters that are available. So here we're getting minimum daily air temperature, maximum daily air temperature, um, the north and south, north, south, and east, west components of wind speed and precipitation. And we're also doing this in parallel. So uh, this function will download all of that data for you and store it locally. And the output of this function is a data frame. So each row in this data frame represents one file that you've downloaded. And so if you did want to dig into the details, if you're kind of a power user, you can use this data frame to, for instance, read these NetCDF files and, and really get into the guts of what these raw data contain. But we, we don't expect that the majority of users really want to do that. Um, a, a common use case that we're anticipating is people might want to average data within their region of interest and work with that in tabular form. So we provide this CFT underscore DF, uh, DF is for data frame function that will take spatial averages uh, for your region of interest and return that as a data frame with one row per date model and ensemble combination. Um, and since we do, do get asked this question quite a bit, this spatial averaging is using all pixels that touch or are contained within your spatial region of interest. And once you've got this data frame, um, if you're familiar with R, you're pretty much off to the races. So um, for your typical R user, it's relatively straightforward to go from this table to, for instance, a time series visualization for a particular parameter of interest. We also expect that people will want to compute their own climate variables. And that's also fairly easy to do here too. So by default, you'll get maximum and minimum air temperature. Maybe you want to compute a midpoint. So you can use the mutate function, which is a function from the dplyr package. Do that. Um, wind speed is usually a little more interesting than the north, south, and east, west components. Wind speed, so you can compute that as a derived variable as well. And both of those can be computed at the daily level, but there are some variable summaries that aggregate among days, for instance, last day of frost, first day of frost, et cetera. And so here we've got an example of computing the growing season length and then visualizing that for each greenhouse gas uh, concentration uh, scenario. And you can see that in Wind Cave National Park, it seems like essentially every model is predicting an increase in the growing season length over time. And then finally, to support the selection of those three to five divergent plausible uh, climate futures, we include this compare periods function that allows you to compare variables um, for some target period and some reference period. You can subset by month. So this is looking at like uh, May through August for both of these in both scenarios. And we try to make it pretty strict, pretty easy to get to this visualization. This is that same scatter plot that I showed in my slides where the x-axis is the difference in daily precip, the y-axis is the difference in daily maximum temperature. And then you can use this to guide your selection of climate futures to support your scenario planning activities. So that's sort of the, the high-level overview um, we also try to make it really easy to see what data you can get with this package. So these are all of the GCMs that you can get. Um, this, these are essentially all the GCMs that you'd be able to get with the MACA data set. And then different uh, greenhouse gas scenarios, different climate parameters. And you can even get like the units and the long form names of these if you want. So that's the vignette. Uh, which is sort of the long form documentation, but we also have, have made an effort to provide um, detailed function level documentation as well so that you can dig into uh, the details of every single one of these functions 
and see exactly what's going on. So that's the quick tour. Um, and as far as what we're planning next, there are a couple of features that we're currently working on. Uh, one of them is supporting the GridNet data set, which is similar to MACA, but it's, it's more consistent with the observed historical meteorological record. So if you want to use historical data, uh, GridNet is a good option. And we're also working on supporting summary tables, um, similar to the one that I showed here, where you could just provide people at a glance what a couple of these climate futures look like. Um, in terms of documentation, we're also going to be working on a more advanced vignette to illustrate how you can work with the raw NetCDF data. So one of the use cases that's come up previously is um, trying to understand trends in space. Uh, for instance, you might want to know, is one part of the park going to be warming at a different rate than another part of the park? And so that's something that we plan to do. And then once we've finished adding features and, and more documentation, we're planning to submit to our OpenSci, which is a, a great organization for reviewing our packages. And we're going to do a simultaneous submission to the Journal of Open Source Software, JOS. And then finally, once we've gotten through that review process, uh, we plan to submit to CRAN, which is the comprehensive R archive network. And this just makes it easier for people to install the package. Um, and by the time we've gotten through these stages, we suspect that the functionality will be uh, pretty stable and we won't be making any real significant changes. So pushing to CRAN at that point should be a, a good time. Um, and with that, I will say uh, use it if you want for your scenario planning activities, uh, species distribution modeling, status assessments. You could use it to figure out where you wanna buy your forever home. If you wanna do that based on potential climate, you can contribute. Uh, we are developing this as an open source package. And we welcome contributions of all kinds, even if you just wanna discuss uh, the potential for adding features, or if you run into any challenges in using or installing the package, feel free to open an issue on GitHub. Um, and uh, I want to also I'll say thanks to John Gross, Amber Runyon, David Lawrence, and Kathy Dello for, for providing input on the package previously. Um, and again, USGS CDI provided funding for the project. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Max. This is great. Um, I think you covered it all. Uh, I, uh, while you were speaking, I just uh, thought it'd be good to clarify that even though you know we have this specific support for the national parks where you can fill in their names, you know the the the, um, the, re the tool works for any shape file within the contiguous U.S. So unfortunately, it doesn't cover Alaska and some of the regions outside the the CONUS, um, because the MACA data doesn't have that. But everything within the contiguous U.S. is covered, um, and any shape file will do it. Yeah, thanks. That's a great point. Because I know um, and, folks from the Fish and Wildlife Service have joined. I just want to make sure they, uh, they get that piece. Um, I had another question, but I forgot. Uh, comment. Yeah, and Owen, Owen M had asked a question in the, the notes document, um, which I, I think MTIs, you may be able to answer better than I can. Uh, the question is, we've received feedback from people that sometimes want to see the whole spread of climate models versus a subset. Are there times when you can think of where using and visualizing model output of all available GCMs can be more important than three to five scenarios? Yeah, I'm still trying to understand the question. Um, but I think uh, we do get, so Max, when you showed the, the scatter plot, it was basically showing uh, all the available models. And, and so, so MACA itself is a subset of all the available GCMs out there. So there are about 35 different global climate modeling communities out there or, or individual global climate models that are in theory separate from each other, but they do share code, so they're not entirely separate from each other. Uh, anyway, so we have uh, kind of 35 word total models, and then MACA is a subset of about 20. Um, but we have kind of over, uh, looked at the overlap of the two, and MACA kind of gets us um, much of that uncertainty expressed by the 35 GCM. So the MACA is a good 
uh, data set that gets us uh, the range of uncertainty, the range of projections, future projections expressed by uh, the global climate models out there. So that'd be the first piece. Uh, so it, it does, the data set itself gets uh, that range of uncertainty that we care about um, in, in assessing risk. The second piece is how, by making a scenario selection of three to five models, how are we ensuring that we're capturing that uncertainty? And that's where kind of the art of, and practice of choosing uh, those scenarios come. And so the, and I, I, I believe I'm answering the question here, where by selecting those three or five models uh, with, the, uh, with the eye for selecting those risks uh, that may emerge out of uh, those different futures, climate futures. And again, there is no perfect way of doing it, but I think the idea is in selecting the scenarios to capture the uncertainty expressed by uh, the whole range of GCMs. Bernard? Yeah, I'll just chime in, Owen, and say, I think, you know, if you're looking at some really process-oriented questions, like, is there a threshold where we may see some sort of chain reaction occurring, then you may want the entire spread. But typically for managers, they're thinking um, about sort of broader questions, you know, where do I spend my funding or um, where might I want to acquire land? And I think looking at those um, extreme endpoints is typically uh, sufficient for them to think about, okay, well, here's a strategy that works under three of these four scenarios. And so maybe that's a good place for me to invest my time and energy in. So I think, you know, there's, the scenario planning works really, really well when you're thinking about um, management and management decisions. But if you are wanting to do some um, really nuanced science and you do want to think about thresholds for changes or for um, chain reactions occurring, then you do want to look at the entire spread and, and do that kind of modeling. So. Oh, John, you can ask a question here or type it in the, the Google Doc, whatever you're more comfortable with. Okay, if you can hear me, I'll just, I'll talk. Um, oh, you just, uh, okay. You muted yourself, John. I accidentally hit a, hit a key. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so I have a, a couple of questions. One is um, the summary, you know, I think the summary table function that you had in your last slide is what's up and coming would be really useful. I'm just curious, um, when when do you think that's going to be an option, or when do you think that will be finished? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're we're in the scoping stage right now. Um, a lot of the table MTI has sent me a few example tables and. They're all a little bit different. And so what we're working on now is figuring out like how to generalize from those specific examples. And it'll probably take us at least a couple of weeks to scope that out. Once it's scoped out, I would guess it'll probably be a matter of a couple months, maybe a few months until we've really got that table functionality supported. Yeah, yeah John, uh, also, you know, uh, we haven't had a, a kind of a, of a deep discussion about that. Uh, the table what it should look like but the the initial idea was that it will cut it will have some generalized variables you know um so a set of 10 to 15 variables at most um so that gives us a first cut to managers uh, of um, what the under these selected scenarios what the changes in these specific climate variables look like but so really that was the kind of first cut information and then hoping that and the and the manager will get back to us and say, you know, we probably need some other variables uh, uh, to be quantified. And that conversation we can have. But I think having that uh, utility of generating table instantaneously as part of this tool would really increase our capacity in a big way for yeah. a lot of projects that we deal with. That kind of got it. You kind of touched on where I was kind of going with it because I know, you know, just from the work you've done for us that, you know, I think you could have a standard suite of those climate metrics, you know, like, you know, mean temperature increase across however many GCMs you want. But then some of the more, you know, some of the most important stuff you provide for us in Piaz is kind of the more nuanced 
stuff around, you know, frequency of drought, which is, you know, I'm, I'm assuming there's more, there's some interpretation then on your end, your personal end versus just kicking something out of a tool. So, so it sounds like it might be those first cut tier variable metrics, you know, that are pretty cut and dry would be the first thing you probably can produce. And then you have to figure out a way to do that second tier the more nuanced set of variables. Is that, is that accurate? Right. Yeah, you're right. And Monka also just provides the climate part of uh, the data set. Does not get us to some of the hydrologic var hydrological variables like soil moisture runoff. And so again, those are the variables that we may have to work separately out of, out, out of this kind of toolbox. Yeah, okay. The next then, question, from, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, wait. Go ahead, John, why don't you finish and we'll go, go to another question then. Well, it's kind of a separate question, but I'm just wondering if you guys have plans to do um, any kind of web front end, like a more of a drop down kind of, you know, I, I'm thinking about from our perspective, it's like the simpler, the better. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that just because it's simpler for you on the web doesn't mean that it doesn't take a heck of a lot of work behind the scenes to create that front end. And I'm just wondering if, if there are plans or do you guys have plans to try to create a front end like that? Um, over the web. Who wants to answer that question? I could take a stab at it. Uh, the short answer is is no, not really. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is there are a couple of uh, more like interactive web-based tools um, already, and I'll I'll paste a link into the chat for an example. And apologies if you've seen this already. Um, so we don't want to to duplicate existing work. And then the second thing is we just don't really have a lot of in-house expertise with building like clean uh, web front ends for this type of thing. Um, so those are the two reasons that I can think of why we're, we're probably not planning to do that in the near future. And, and I'll just add that um, right now what we really want to do is add the features for example other data sources or additional variables or the table outputs. And I think I'm really hesitant to commit to building a web front end now when the back end might change. So um, it, it will probably take a while before we can get to the point even of thinking about like, okay, if we don't have in-house expertise, do we wanna go outside and start thinking about building a web front end? Um, I think we wanna get the, the back end really solid first and make sure that you know, we're not going to have to do substantial um, rebuilds later down the road. But this question does come up, and uh, even from my own internal team, and I'm, but I don't know if creating something like an R Shiny app somewhere between is less of an uplift than um, less of a lift than uh, a whole web portal. It's potentially that way, but I mean, any time then you make a substantial update to the um, toolbox, it's going to break the Shiny app and then someone will have to go and fix it. So uh, I think it's at the point right now where there are enough commits happening on the code on a regular basis that it's probably not an efficient place to put time and energy. Um, but it's probably the number one question that we get is like, is there ever going to be a web front end or some kind of graphical user interface for working with the toolbox? And I think potentially down the road, but it's definitely not in that list of um, immediate features that Max went over. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering if there's a way, you know, we, the, the people that are using, you know, that are kind of dependent on your data, maybe, we could figure out a funding mechanism to try to tailor a web front end for our uses. You know, I mean, you know, I could see, and I'm thinking like a really rudimentary um, web front end, you know, like for, for our people, for the service, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, it'd be, it'd be basically three steps, you know, can we look at the scatter plot, right? Choose the four to five scenarios, choose the climate metrics we want, and then kick it out as a table as a summary table. And, you know, if we could get that and, and it would allow our field biologists to be able to do that pretty in a simple way, that, that gets us probably 
to where we need to be. So anyway, I'm just wondering, I'm thinking out loud, but I think maybe maybe we should have a conversation within the service and we've got a new science apps ARD now that just came on, I think this week and I haven't met her or, or know her or anything, but I'm thinking maybe that's a discussion we could have in house about, could we pull some money together to try to get that started in parallel? Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, I think I really appreciate those comments and it's, again, it's about usability you know, it's in serving at large. Um, you know, I really want to scale it up. Uh, whatever we can and I think um, we can have that conversation further but I think again down the road it's uh, not part of the image uh, I, I think developing this tool uh, so that's why you can see is the version is 0 0.10 so it's not even version one right now so I think uh, I still see several months of work into developing these tools further where you know it's actually working for folks who are able to use R and it's, it's providing all the use, useful utilities and I think the next yeah. thing we can talk about is maybe developing something that can be used by a greater. Okay. Number. Yeah, and I didn't mean, you know, I didn't mean that in a bad way at all. MT has it because we have several R users within our shop that could get the information that we need out of it. I'm just, I'm thinking, you know, I'm just thinking about how, how we could make that accessible to, to someone and, you know, to a lot of our other people who don't use R. So. Yeah, and um, Amber did ask a question in the notes document about um, the upcoming release of CMIP 6. Uh, so along with the IPCC, the next generation of climate model data, and then is there a plan to add other climate data sets? Um, Max and Travis, the student who was working with him, um, did design this as a sort of modular uh, workflow. So we do hope to be able to add in other data sources. And it was proactively designed um, looking ahead to the fact that we would have CMUP 6 coming up. Um, yeah, I, I know like one of the things that we talked about when we were discussing what would our first set of data be was um, the fact that BC, BCSD gives you those hydrologic variables that you don't get in Maka. So um, it's definitely on our list of features that we want to address going forward, um, just having that additional flexibility. And that's kind of where I get hesitant about building a front end right now is if we add in brand new features for ingesting new data sources, then that has a cascading effect where the front end will need to be worked on um, in order to still be compatible. So um, we have a lot of questions, I think, on how we're going to resolve some of these uh, major feature developments going forward. And Joel had the question about Alaska, you know, and of course we don't have any, any plans to cover Alaska through CAS, through North Central CAS work not part of our region, unfortunately. Um, but I, I was just going to say that, um, you know, we have other projects that Shelly and I are, will be working on this transformational drive project where we'll be thinking about Alaska and the data sets available there. So Amber, if you can pass the message to Joel <laughs> that, you know, there may be other ways that we've been thinking about, we'll be thinking about Alaska and we have to chat with him. And we have been sharing this tool with the rest of our Climate Adaptation Science Center network. So there is a cask in Alaska. Um, and then of course in the Pacific Islands. Um, and both of them have created downscaled um, projection data for their regions. And then in the Southeast, they've done it for Puerto Rico. So I think there, this goes to, to Amber's question about um, additional data sources, there's a potential for developing that capability, uh, especially if the scientists there are willing to help support some of that code development. Um, it's something that we'd like to be able to do, but we just didn't address it in this first cut. Can you hear this? Yep. Okay, um, this is John Gross, and I was just wondering, as you were talking, um, Max, the last webinar you gave for us for a small MPS group, you had some really great examples where we asked you, could you do this plot or that plot, and you just kind of knocked it out using the tidyverse, and some of us are a little bit older and are still into like, you know, reshape and meld and um, not very fluent with um, 
some of the newer ways to do it. And I was just thinking, I, I, I totally get it about web interfaces. We're, you know, as you know, we're pretty much in our shop. So, um, and I know web interfaces, it's just, but, but it would be really helpful. Maybe the next project that, that MTS was working on or you, or, you know, maybe we could work with you to just write the code that you use to generate that those products for that particular one you know like i gave a webinar to yellowstone yesterday and a lot of the stuff you're talking about you know we generated it but we used a lot of separate you know i still miss sas tabulate you know i mean it was just such a great thing and r doesn't have anything that kind of really works and you say where do i want and how many decimal points and all that and it just knocks the table out so it's a real pain in the butt to write you know, a couple hundred lines of code to figure out how do you do this graphic, and you just had some really slick things. And I just thought if you did kind of a an example, I mean, it could even be here's MTS's slide deck for this webinar that he gave, and then here's the R code that we used to do it. And you know, you could link them and say this works with this version. So you know, when I looked at that code, I'd know that if it's a year old and used version 0.01, and now you're working on version two. As an R user, I would expect that there would be some glitches in it, and that would be fine with me. But I'd have an example of how somebody who's pretty sophisticated and who's thought through how to do these things, because you know, I I would approach it probably quite different than you. And I suspect you have kind of this holistic vision of this is how the data comes in, and these are the, you know, this is why I did, you know, put it in this structure, and here's how it fits into using the tidy commands to get this kind of a product. And none of the rest of us have the benefit of the six months or year, or however long you spent working that out. And I know it's a lot of trouble to write up articles and things, but just having the code is extremely helpful. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, John. So if, if I'm understanding correctly, are you talking about like something of a collection of examples of how to do like tidyverse style data analysis with these uh, daily climate data sets that link back to products we've actually generated, for instance, tables that MTS has generated? Exactly, because I'm guessing the tables MTS generates are exactly, I mean, like every workshop we do, the first thing we're doing is we're looking at annual changes in precipitation and temperature by GCM. Once we select the ones we want to use, we're, we're generating another table and it's got those annual values, plus, plus it's probably got monthly values or seasonal values in it. Um, we're probably looking at days above freezing or days above and below a threshold. I mean, I think we all do that for all of our kind of climate adaptation workshops. And so just having the code written out that does that really efficiently the way you would do it with your code, not probably the way I would do it. Um, and then the plots that you want to generate, you know, with ggplot, there's always this stuff about getting it just right and particularly getting the fonts right or what theme you're using or whatever. And just having, you know, if you're generating that for your own products, just having an example of that. So it'd be kind of like a vignette without the text. And I just, I just think you don't have to necessarily publish it, but if, you know, if you're doing a webinar like this, here's an example of a fairly complete set of codes that we use for this workshop. And, you know, we'd have to go in obviously and change the threshold values or do whatever we want to make it. But it's, as we all know, it's a lot easier to revise code than it is to create it. Yeah, I love that I think, idea. You know, I learn a lot. I also learn a lot reading other people's code. And I, there's no question the stuff you did, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's really cool. That would have taken me six lines and I'd have to think about it. And you did it in one line. It was just there. And so, you know, it would really allow us to benefit from, from your expertise with those particular packages. Yeah, I would, I would love to, to develop uh, essentially like a collection of vignettes that actually were used for real adaptation planning activities. I know we have a couple that are upcoming and I think that would be great for a couple of reasons. One, just reproducibility. Can we reproduce the analysis that we used for each activity? Um, and then second, to help people understand how to use the package. So yeah, that's a, that's a yep. great idea. I'll think more about that. And also thanks for your um, suggestions last time on our previous call. Those were super useful in, in sort of sure. uh, fine tuning the package. Yeah, John, I second that. I think that's a good comment. And I, I have not been working on R. I use another language and I do save codes and they've been very helpful. So I point noted, you know, as I start to work with this tool and start using R, I'll start saving these codes uh, as part of the project. Uh, yeah. 
Oh, um, I just want to go to Lara's question because it's been there for a while. And, um, and Lara is talking about the issue of resolution. Um, and Lara, feel free to jump in uh, uh, through the Zoom. Um, but I'm just trying to understand your question that uh, about adding feature that intersects high resolution topographic analysis. Yeah, I don't know. We haven't thought about, so, you know, we always have this aspect of, you know, when I'm working on any of these natural resource management projects, they're very localized. And uh, some, in many of these cases, like with the project on white-tailed ptarmigan, you know, they are at, at 12,000 feet or above in, 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 in our state here in Colorado. And those kind of topographic uh, values are not achieved at four kilometer grid scale, for example. Um, however, you know, we are able to, it's about interpreting whatever resolution you have to that elevation. And it's a part of, um, and that's where, you know, you and I talk about how much of this data you can interpret for your, uh, you know, for your case, uh, for your specific use case, and where to take the change factor that's coming out of this, uh, this downscale product, which is again coming out of the change factors coming out of GCM without much coarser resolution. So where can you take, for what variables you can take those change factors at, at the face value from, uh, from this tool versus others where you have to be a little more careful uh, to incorporate it. I, I hope I'm capturing um, some of what you were asking. Yeah, I mean, I, w I wasn't sure if the way people normally handle this issue isn't just saying that relatively they're, they're different. It's at, it's at a large scale that you're looking at, but you know, there's just this relative difference projected into the future. So that's what we're, we're interested in. And this finer like microclimate scale is gonna change in the same way. Um, so I, I didn't, I mean, how have you guys handled it when you work with these populations or these species that have basically a population that's within four kilometers and there's, you're, you're just saying, okay, this is what it is now and this is how it's going to change and the whole population gets that same Usually, you know, you have the data for what has been historical and yeah. for future, you usually add the change factors from a more coarser resolution information. So if the climate model or, or something like MACA is telling you at four kilometer, your region will warm by two degrees, you just apply that two degree to, if it was, if the threshold was 78 degrees um, in your historical, you make it 80. That's how we've been doing that because in, Otherwise, you really have to model it by first principle, and that's modeling all of these at very high resolution. is a totally different ball game. It's a tricky yeah. business. But I think, but at the same time, I think it's 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 physically. Cons I mean, uh, there's a lot of support for doing that among scientists. I mean, so that, that makes sense to most people. That a lot of the climate is occurring at the large scale, but then you should be aware of your local scale features and tendencies in, as it connects to the large scale change. Um, mm -hmm. So we do bring in relationships and all um, of large scale feature with the local scale to kind of derive what a future may look like at that local scale. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I haven't thought about this a lot. So I'm just wondering what you've thought about so far. And um, yeah, thank you. That's helpful. I would just add, Laura, this is John, but yep. you know, Wolverine work was a really good example of what MTS was talking about where you were looking at those really large scale deltas for the changes in temperature and precip over the next 40 years or so, and then applying those deltas back down to the finer scale information that we had for snow modeling. You know, that's where you brought in slope and your deep mm -hmm. elevation and all that stuff to get, to try to get down closer to the densite scale. So, but, you know, that was a pretty involved project to, to be able mm -hmm. to do that and, you know, then that was one of the questions I had was for Max was, you know, on the resolution. So when it's kicking out the table of data, that's, that's coming out as four kilometer downscale data. Is that right? 
Yeah, I think the idea is we would first average over the region of interest and then compute those summaries. Okay. So, you know, I think that'd be pretty useful for us on some of the SDM modeling if we wanted to basically, basically get that four kilometer table data and then be able to input those into our models, you know, for the future inputs for, for the climate stuff at four kilometer resolution, which would be pretty handy. Yeah, and that's, that's sort of what we're thinking about for this advanced usage vignette. So if you were building an SDM at four kilometer resolution, you'd need to, to generate those layers at that native resolution, right? So I think that's sort of uh, one of the things that we've got in the works. And that is one of the use cases that we're hoping to anticipate. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we've had a little bit of discussion in the chat box on Zoom, but Tab asked a really um, good question, which is, is there anything that kind of gives guidance on what is a, a better GCM for this region? Um, and, and I figured that's something that might be of interest to others on the call. Uh, and what we found is that better really depends on what your use case is and what your priorities are. So if you're really interested in annual precipitation or if you need some kind of seasonal um, interpretation of the data or even if you're looking at extreme daily events, um, the definition of what is better or the best uh, can change. And so uh, MTS has been serving a little bit in a dial of climate scientist role uh, where when people have this question of which GCMs might be appropriate to use in which context, he has a conversation about what is your need, what are you trying to accomplish, and then helps you think through that process of what might be the best um, match for your unique circumstances. So uh, just to kind of give that to the whole group. Um, and MTS, I don't know if you want to chime in a little about um, your experiences. Uh, this comes up often. And, um, and, I, and I think I'm just saying what the community at large uh, says is that, um, you know, try to be as inclusive as possible. So, you know, even if you select a model out there, and these are all some of the best climate models that are put in the IPCC report. So, I mean, you know, each climate modeling community has several models and they select their best and put it out there, but they may not be performing very well for a specific region of the globe. And, and there's some ranking done based on that. But even, even if they're not performing well in the historic, it does not mean that they will not perform well in the future. I mean, so the, the information that telling us about the changes in the future may still be relevant. And so, but you know, uh, you can choose to select some model based on their historical performance and by the guidance is always be inclusive in your first gut so see the whole spread and then choose not to select a specific model rather than start with a smaller set um, so yeah there's some literature that um indicates that models that uh perform really well in the historic period are actually probably overtrained or over constrained. And so they may not have very good performance for future conditions. So how you define better or best is, can be really challenging. Thanks, Aparna. Uh, yeah, can I, can I just add onto that really quickly? Please. So, um, and I guess one thing that, that I've kind of come across, and not just with climate models, but other, other kinds of data sets, is that it's, um, it's also kind of challenging to understand uh, kind of what the focus was when that group was developing it. So, so like even with some of the, the models that are more about like forage phenology and things like that, that I work with a lot, um, you know, it's, it's really helpful to know that they were focusing on arid ecosystems when they were developing the, the model that they were developing, because then you don't, you know, you expect that they probably do okay in arid ecosystems, but you know that they're probably, they, they may or may not do well in the, the Pacific Northwest or whatever. 
Um, so I guess, and, and I don't know um, whether that's a, a piece of how, how uh, the climate modelers are considering it is, is are they, um, in, at least in some cases, uh, doing that with a specific purpose or, or, and is that information readily available? The, the, the GCM community is really looking at the globe, global processes. So really, US has 2% of the land, uh, the total surface area. So if they get it wrong for the US, but get it right for the Pacific Ocean, they will select that feature. Uh, but what a point I'm making is, no, I think they're, they're really trying to get these very large global scale features right in the first place. So even they are struggling to get the, the phenomenon of El Nino right, right now, for example. For them, that's a bigger piece of the puzzle than a regional. And that's why, you know, we do those downscaling where the bias correction is a very important step that all these models have biases and we correct for the biases. Some models have greater biases, others have lesser biases. So should we just not select the model with greater biases? And that's a question which is a good research question, but I think for practice, uh, scientists are saying, just be more inclusive if you can, because um, again, it's about risk, right? If you can, if you want to consider the bigger range of risk versus the smaller range of risk. Yeah, as NTR said, um, you know, global climate models are coded based on sort of first principles of energy balance and um, Clausius clapeyron and all that fun stuff, <laughs> not your Stokes equations. So, um, you know, they're trying to get the large scale circulation patterns correct for the atmosphere and for the ocean. And that's where they start with um, evaluating GCM performance and all of this other stuff about local regional performance is coming sort of later in the more recent years. Um, I put a link to a, a USGS report uh, for the Southeast in the chat box, but it's it gets really technical really fast and understanding the nuance between why one model is considered better for rainfall in the southeast around the gulf versus another um, can get into some of the nitty gritties of like how do they deal with um, the randomness of whether something condenses into a cloud and it's it's probably not worth your brain power and effort to, <laughs> to, to think about those things. And I think it's, as MTI has said, better to be inclusive at this point, especially if you're chaining it to like a, another, like a species distribution model, or um, I mean, we have people who chain GCM information to a hydrologic model to get in-stream flow and then to a fish population model. And so at that point, like whether a cloud forms is, it's not going to be the driving factor um, of your results. I'll just share one slide. Um, and just to make a point, uh, just, just uh, to labor this conversation. Um, so this I share, have shared with a lot of uh, you out there. And this is part of publication, published material. And it's been used by agencies to kind of you know, select not, or not select certain models. So these are some ranking provided by scientists out there. These are 20 models that are part of the MACA uh, collection. And so, so, so this is coming out of the Art Forest Service uh, Research uh, Planning Act uh, work for 2020. And they have used this kind of ranking to not select certain low performing models. And that's totally fine. But they considered the whole, uh, uh, so they, and I'll go to the next slide. So they did consider the whole range of and so there are 20 models here, and then they chose not to select um, some of the models that rank kind of low on the side. So you see some models do rank pretty high on kind of for all regions, while others don't. And again, you question why is that happening, you know? Um, and so I think, it's, again, it's more in the research realm, but you can use something like this to guide your model selection. But I think that should be your secondary filter. It should not be your primary filter. Your primary filter should be to work across really the range of future projection. And if you can here, if you can select between A and B, and if you want to select A because it's ranking higher, you can do that. But you've, you've kind of covered this quadrant of uncertainty. Okay. 
Thank you, that's helpful. We have five more minutes, but uh, just seeing if there are any other questions out there. Comments.